Prophet Muhammad fled during the persecution to the Arabian Peninsula. They have no historical evidence for this. None whatsoever. And yet this is their claim. So he admits this, Hans Kuhn, and in the end, after explaining that he recognizes that the original Christianity was Judaic, Semitic Christianity, had nothing to do with what later occurs, he says, in spite of all this, I'm not saying we should all become Jewish Christians, because what he means is we have to become Muslim, because that's the only place they have any historical link, is 7th century. He said, I'm not saying that I'm perfectly content with being a Hellenistic Christian. This is what he said. And the Catholics and all these things, right? And also, the Vatican have to give up all the gold that it stole from everybody. And that's problematic for them, right? It's one of the richest corporations in the world. The Catholic Church is one of the richest corporations in the world. It's actually a state, the papal state. They're the first state that recognized Hitler's government. It's a papal state. It's its own state. It's not part of Italy. So this is, this is the, the, the state of Christianity that, that, that takes place. Now what happens is, and Allahu Alam, the formulation of all this is very complicated. You start reading about it, it gets more and more complicated. But there is a massive amount of evidence and documentation that has been published recently. Unbelievable. Most of this stuff was done in the 19th century. They don't like to admit this, that they've known this stuff for a hundred years. They don't like to admit this. The Tubingen School in Germany, they uh, completely discredited the four Gospels as valid sources, as historical documents. They recognize them for what they are as propaganda tracts. I mean, this is, this is just fact now amongst the scholars. Amongst devout Christians, you know, uh, there's two types. There's the fundamentalists who don't uh, barely know how to read in the first place, but those who do know how to read choose not to read. They choose just to, that I believe this the devil um, devil's trying to trick me the devil's trying to lead me astray so I'm not going to listen to this they consider the Muslims like devils once you start using logic and things like this and trying to to bring rational argument to the discourse it's a, this is inspired by the devil because it sounds good right and this is the way they look at it and then there's the intellectual Christian who's in a crisis so they become Buddhist Buddhist Christian they do Zen uh, meditation and uh, have ecumenic you know, we're all one and peace and love and, you know, Muslims, let's talk about it and, you know, it's all one in the end of the day. This is the other. This is the, the liberal. You have the, the right wing and the left wing. And this is, the, this, is the, this is where they go. They tend to go. The right wing and the left wing. Take your choice. And this is where they end up in one of these camps. For the Muslims, the middle way, we, when we look, this, all of this information that has come out has only confirmed what people believed on good faith from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 1400 years. I mean, this, really our iman should be increased in this age, but unfortunately we have become an ummah that doesn't read. We choose to uh, watch videos and we, we become an ummah of listening and not reading, right? The first revelation is iqra, it wasn't isma. Isma means listen. It was not Isma, it was Iqra. And this is something that the Muslim, we've left uh, this type of knowledge. We just listen by word of mouth. We come word of mouth to things coming around. Did you hear so and so and did you hear this and that? But it, once you read and investigate at what their own scholars have arrived at, which we should have been doing this research ourselves, but we, do, we don't have scholars that study these things, go into engineering instead of other uh, sciences. And, and these social sciences and humanities are extremely important, but unfortunately we place no emphasis whatsoever on uh, comparative religion. There's Muslims that condemn comparative religion and use hadith of the Prophet forbidding Omar to study the Torah. Because it wasn't Omar's business to study the Torah. You see, I mean, they, they were at a point when this was not, that this was not, they were having direct revelation from Allah, and the Prophet was alive, confronting these people as a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah said, أحسن. And the later ulama, including Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah has a huge volume work, in which he refutes the, uh, the, the Christians completely from their own books. He studied the Torah and the Injil and chose completely. It's eight volumes. 
It is extraordinary work. So the Muslims did do investigation in comparative religion. But unfortunately, mo most Muslims completely avoid it. And we're, this is a golden opportunity now. Because they have literally dismantled, deconstructed their religion. And they can't do it to the Quran. They, all they've attempted to do it is with the Hadith. They can't do it with the Quran. So they attempt to do it with the Hadith, to deconstruct the Hadith, which is an easier target. Because the Hadith has, there, there are all types of Hadith. And there were liars and there were well, Wadi'een people that made up Hadith and things like this. But the Hadith is preserved, it's very exact science. So, g get the God and take it back to Kaaba. Right? And this is what they would do. It's like in China to this day, the Chinese worship gods in their villages. And if the village starts doing poor economically, they'll go look for a village that's doing well economically, and they'll throw away the gods that aren't benefiting them, and they'll bring the gods from the village that's doing well economically. It's a very pragmatic type of idolatry. So this is what the, these people were doing. They were worshiping all of these idols. And the, the Mithraic teaching had, was, was the, the, the Mithraic God was born on December 25th. This is in their own, what's, the research that's been done, born on the, December 25th. He was called Sol Invictus, the conquering sun god. The sun god. And this is why Christians worship on Sunday, not S-O-N, S-U-N. It's not the Son of God. It's Sunday, the day of soul. The day of the Son God. And this is important. And it's going to be connected with the idea of the Messiah Dajjal. Because the Messiah Dajjal is also a Son God. The Son God, they believed, was the giver of life. In the same way the Son gives life to plants through photosynthesis as we know in biology now. They... They believed that the sun god would also give life after death. People would die, they would be resurrected. In the same way that Mithra, who kills himself, he does an act of self-immolation and kills himself for the sins of mankind. He becomes a scapegoat. This is Mithra's act. He had 12 disciples. The disciples represented the 12 zodiacal constellations, right? There are 12, you know, in horoscope, which we do not believe in. And Muslims that, I saw an ad in a Muslim paper of an Arraf. You know what an Arraf is in Arabic? Arraf. It's like an astrologer, somebody diviner, that does that. And it said, Arraf wa shi'ari al amana wa thiqa. This guy said, I'm an astrologer, and my, my uh, to their book, was commanded to kill the Arrafin and the Munajimin. The Jews don't believe in that. But the, 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 the Mithras believed in this 12 zodiacal constellations, and each one of them represented a disciple. There is no number given of the Hawariyun. There's no number that says they were 12 in the Islamic tradition. And, and Jesus, quote-unquote, making 13, which is what the Christians call the devil's number. Very interesting. I mean, they're so superstitious, they don't even have a 13th floor. In, I don't know if they do that here, but in the United States, you go from 12 to 14 in a, in a building. They don't have a 13th floor. So this is their number. They call that the devil's number, 13. And this is the number of Mithra and his disciples. Now what happens with Mithra, Paul literally takes the Mithraic teaching and embellishes it with aspects of the Christian teaching. He took, what he took was the death of Mithra, who, who transforms himself in, in the Roman Empire is where the Vatican now stands. This is historical evidence. It is where the Vatican now stands. The mother of Mithra was worshipped. The mother of Mithra was worshipped. So this was all part of this uh, redaction of the Judaic teaching, the Semitic Christianity becomes this Mithraic reality, completely transformed, completely altered, until it is unrecognizable. St. Augustine and the Christians were so bothered by the similarities between Christianity and Mithraism that they would not mention Mithraism by its name. They called Mithra the fellow in the cap, the Phrygian cap. They wouldn't even mention him by his name. And St. Augustine says in his writings that he met a priest from the fellow in the cap. And and he said to St. Augustine, you know, our, our man is a Christian also. In other words, it's really the same teaching and doctrine. The Christians completely wiped out the books, the temples, 
all of the evidence of Mithraism was completely wiped out. And that's why it's only recently, in the last hundred years, that scholars, anthropologists, and uh, archaeologists have been digging up all of this stuff and finding out about this teaching. Extraordinary. You find